Hello everyone, I'm Xiaoying, producer of Soundbites and your webinar host. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am presenting from today, the Camry Girl people of the Greater Aura Nation, and the collective land where we're all attending the meeting from, and also pay my respects to past elders and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the virtual meeting uh, we're all in today. So what are the experiences of Aboriginal caregivers in supporting their children's hearing health and language development? And what are their experiences of audiology and speech pathology services? Welcome to the season finale of Soundbites 2022. Today we have a very special panel discussion with four highly regarded Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander healthcare workers and researchers. We're very fortunate today also that Tony um, can join us um, today and we didn't even have time to change the, and update our slides, so I'll leave the suspense to the presenter's introduction coming very soon, and I'm sure many of you already know Tony. The panel will be moderated by Isabel O'Keefe. Okay, so without any more further ado, um, I would like to hand over to Isabel. Thanks so much, Shayin. Um, so I'll uh, briefly introduce myself and then hand over to other members of the panel to introduce themselves. But thank you so much for coming today. Um, and I want to thank uh, particularly the Hearing Australia First Nations team who have actually rescheduled a meeting um, to come along today. So thanks so much to all of you who are here today. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Isabella O'Keefe. I'm joining from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, uh, and I pay my respects to their elders uh, past and present, and extend respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attending today, um, and all those who we've worked with, uh, including the caregivers in this study who've uh, provided such important insights, and the Aboriginal research leadership team uh, who provided oversight for this study uh, and we're really fortunate to have two members of that team here today, uh, Tony and Tremaine, uh, who I'll hand over to in a minute. Um, so I'm a non-Indigenous researcher with a background in linguistics and musicology and I first developed an interest in Aboriginal languages, music and culture uh, during my primary school years where I grew up at Pukaja on the Anangul Pindjata Yankunja Dada lands in Central Australia. Uh, for my PhD research, I worked with communities in Western Arnhem Land to document languages and songs of that really multilingual region. Um, and I've also worked with some Aboriginal uh, linguists and educators in um, northwestern New South Wales to work on language revitalisation projects. I joined NAL about two years ago. Um, and before that, I'd worked for about six months with Hearing Australia on the Plum and Hats project with other presenters. Uh, here today and other NAL researchers, including Sam Harkis, Carmen Kuhn, Viv Marnane, uh, and Wiradjuri Public Health researcher Michelle Kennedy, who also assisted with this study that we're going to discuss today. Uh, it's been fantastic to work with such a multidisciplinary team with a range of different expertise and experience. And I've learned so much from all of them, including uh, you, Tony, and Tremaine. So I'll hand over. Uh, Tremaine, would you like to introduce yourself? And then Tony, and then Megan. Yeah, my guys, my name is Tremaine Rankmore, um, proud graduate man from Dubbo, um, currently, like, currently sitting at Newcastle. So I'd like to acknowledge the Awabakal people where I'm meeting today, um, pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, so currently I'm an Aboriginal health practitioner um, and I work across seven mainstream general practices in the Newcastle area. And... I guess I've been working in e-health research now for the last two years um, with the University of Newcastle and the HMRI, um, where I'm sitting at the moment. Um, I guess I've been in Aboriginal health now for 10 years. Um, first started at the, <coughs> excuse me, first started at the AMS in Tamworth um, and then relocated to Newcastle in 2018. Um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. And um, yeah, been been fortunate enough to be with the Hearing Australia and NAL team um, for the past couple of years now uh, in some e health research, and looking forward to talking to you guys today. Thanks, Tremaine. 
Thanks, Jermaine. Tony. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which I'm zooming in, or meeting with you all today. Um, that will be what we call Warramai Country and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and for mob that will be joining, perhaps joining us today as well. Um, so I'm Tony Manton. I'm a Kami Pingle woman from the Warramai Nation. Um, I've worked in Aboriginal health for a fair while. I'm not going to tell you how long because it'll give away how old I am and I want you to all think that I'm young and deadly. So, yeah, I'm not going to say that. Um, so I started my career as an Aboriginal health worker um, and I'm currently uh, working in two different places, so at the PHN as a commissioning coordinator, um, but more recently as a researcher in e-health research. Um, I've worked on a couple of different studies, particularly around um, uh, caregivers' perspectives. Um, young people um, and also um, supporting Kelvin Kong in his re research on uh, Storm Forward. So um, thanks and I do hope that you enjoyed today. Thanks, Tony. Megan. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Megan Ward. I'm an audiologist. I'm staying on Gadigal um, Country. And um, so I'm a paediatric audiologist with Hearing Australia, or I was for um, most of my working career. Um, I started doing um, outreach work for the First Nations unit in Hearing Australia about 13, 14 years ago, and have done a lot of work in the Northern Territory in remote communities um, and in Sydney, urban and some um, regional communities as well. I was lucky enough to start working um, on the Plum and Hats project about three or four years ago, many of you will know, and now I work for NAL and I get to work on these wonderful projects with fantastic people. Um, I'm going to hand back to Isabel now and she's going to just give a brief um, overview of the, of the background and of this study. Thanks so much, Aron. Yeah, so I'll just, I'll try to keep this nice and brief so we can get into a bit more of the kind of conversation. Um, but just wanted to give you some background about the study. Um, so we know that there's high rates of hepatitis media and related conductive hearing loss among young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. And we know that this can impact on the development of their listening, uh, speech and language skills. So early intervention is really key. Um, so our study focused on the importance of caregiver perspectives in informing this early intervention, ensuring family-centred and culturally safe provision and care. Um, so we aim to explore the perspectives of Aboriginal caregivers of young children um, with hearing problems on how they support their children's hearing health and language development and on their experiences with audiology and speech pathology services. Uh, so we had oversight um, from an Aboriginal research leadership team uh, that included Tremaine and Tony and was led by Wiradjuri researcher Michelle Kennedy. And we really aimed to privilege the voices and experiences of Aboriginal caregivers. Uh, the study had ethics approval from um, Human Research Ethics Committees of the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Committee of New South Wales, uh, Menzies Top End and Hearing Australia. Uh, interviews were conducted with caregivers using the yarning method, uh, meaning that the interviews were relaxed and informal conversations between researcher and participants uh, with relationality as key. And participants were really encouraged to share stories of their lived experience in the way that they wanted to. Um, so the interviews uh, started with social yarning to establish those relationships and then research topic yarning to explain the research. Uh, and once caregivers had had the opportunity to ask any questions and provide consent, um, the rest of the interview was audio recorded uh, and these were then transcribed and analysed qualitatively uh, using a reflexive thematic analysis approach. Um, so we had five interviews uh, in an urban New South Wales community that were uh, conducted by uh, Dr Michelle Kennedy uh, and three interviews um, were conducted with Aboriginal caregivers into remote NT communities uh, by non-Indigenous researchers, uh, me and Jodie Kell assisted uh, with one of those. 
Um, Jody and I are both non-Indigenous, um, but we've got uh, we've had long-term relationships uh, with these communities that we um, did the interviews in. Um, we have an understanding of the local language ecologies or contexts uh, and some basic competence in local languages. We had planned to employ a community-based uh, Aboriginal research assistant in the NT, which would have been fantastic. Um, however, unfortunately, they weren't available during this time due to work, family and other commitments. Um, so all of the participants um, were all caregivers of one or more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children aged 12 years or under who had hearing problems, uh, and they were recruited through the researchers' social networks um, to ensure that there was kind of rich data around ear health and hearing journeys. Um, they needed to have at least experience with one allied health service, so either audiology or speech pathology. Um, and the participants included five mothers and three grandmothers. Uh, and many of the participants or their families um, worked in health or education contexts. Uh, but to protect the identities of participants, the communities are not named as well. So in terms of some of the main themes, and then we'll be able to get into this conversation, um, the two main themes that we really identified um, in the data were that caregivers are and really have to be um, proactive uh, in seeking support and also in, in supporting their children at home. Uh, and the second one was that ear health and hearing pathways are complex. They're difficult to navigate and difficult to access at times. Um, so one lovely quote that kind of talks about the, that proactivity is uh, from a participant in the NT. He said, I used to tell them, that is the hearing service, get this done for my kids so they can hear and speak well in the future. Uh, and in terms of the complexity of systems, um, a participant from New South Wales said, we came home from the hospital, that was after an acute ear infection, we never heard back, um, no one followed us up, we kept us, kept talking to our local Aboriginal Control Community Health Organisation, we finally got an appointment with the ENT, it was, lots was really confusing, then we had to speak to the speech pathologist who said you have to get a referral, so we went back to our Aboriginal Controlled Health Organisation to get a referral. Then we were able to get it through NDIS because one of the children had an NDIS plan. So you can see there's so many different parts of that journey. Um, so Megan, are you able to just start with outlining a few of um, from that data, some of the ways that we found that caregivers were proactive? Uh, and then I'll hand over to Tony and Tremaine. Sure. Um, it was, they were proactive in so many ways and had to be, okay. so. In seeking medical um, help, so hearing tests, speech pathology, referrals to ENT, um, treatment, um, but that it just kept going on and on and on, and that's the nature of um, ongoing ear disease. Unfortunately, um, I love this quote. I think it really highlights this. Um, this is from one of the um, New South Wales parents. So after about the 10th ear infection, I started to look for other GPs in the area, tried probably another two, and just was told, it's just daycare, J daycare germs. They'll get used to it once he turns one. So that that mum was really conscious that it was not just daycare germs, and she just had to keep going and going and going. Um, so not only was she dealing with being um, dismissed, and that was a common theme that kept coming up, that, that these caregivers were dismissed by um, professionals, I'm afraid. Um, but also that she she shopped around and she went where she thought she'd be listened to. Um, and then they the caregivers were proactive in that they then helped other families. So she went, goes on to say, we've had friends that have had their kids in similar situations and both my husband and I are like, this is what you have to do. Like, this is how you get it quicker. And we've been able to help advocate for them to make sure that they don't go through what we went through as well. And that that's, um, you know, so it's that building on community that's really helped. Um, Tony and Tremaine, do you want to add to that? Yeah, <clears throat> I guess that's, you know, the main thing about, you know, our caregivers is there's not like a direct sort of pathway for them. So um, I know being proactive as a parent, you're generally <clears throat> going to someone else you know, whether that's 
you know, your auntie or your uncle or someone that's been there and done that before um, and getting information off them. So it's kind of a bit of a shame that, um, you know, you do go to the GPs quite frequently and you're going back with your infection after your infection. After your infection after your done. Um, but being proactive, I guess, um, me and Tony collectively, um, yesterday or the day before, we actually got a phone call from um, a colleague or a, or, a, or a friend, basically, and, and was saying, this is what's happening with our child. What do we do? Um, so it's definitely a big thing is that they're being proactive and they've got to do this for themselves. Um, and that's a bit of a shame, really. Yeah. you get any more thoughts to add to that, Tony, either from what you read with these caregivers or or from your own experiences? Um, you guys hear me okay? Yeah, yeah cool. All right. I just want to touch on it in terms of everything. I think sometimes that um, we shouldn't always put the onus back onto the caregivers. I know it's their responsibility to do it, but... If a parent hopes to go to the GP, there's a reason for that parent taking that child to the GP. And um, I think sometimes it's really important for clinicians to understand that there's a perfectly good reason and we can need to listen a little bit more to parents rather than just saying it's good for that or something. So I, I, I I understand that yes, it is for the parents, you know, um, to, you know, um, take the responsibility for the parents to take the child to the GP. But if they're constantly there, I think clinicians need to stop and think about this is something that we really do need to take into consideration. And they're not coming here for no reason. All right? So, yeah, that's what I'll say. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that, Tony. Unfortunately, your audio was a little bit crackly, um, but yeah, thanks for reflecting. I know you were talking about how, yeah, there's, there is that sort of responsibility of parents, but the onus is kind of constantly on parents. And I know that that's something that's come out, I think, um, in the other research that you were involved in um, with Sam and Megan on the urban hearing pathways, just that the, the onus was always on parents. Um, and so that idea of clinicians needing to listen, um, especially when parents are having to come back over and over. And hopefully Tony's IT will be okay. <laughs> um, Megan, I know we we had some discussions as we were going through the data as well um, about things that we found particularly striking. Could you reflect on, on one of those uh, things that you found quite striking? Yes, it was, uh, I expected caregivers to talk about wait times and about the difficulties they had um, in just getting appointments and getting tests and treatments. But um, what I was really, um, what I was really found quite compelling was how proactive the parents were in what they had to do at home in supporting their child. So a lot of the parents talked about um, dealing with the child's frustration, nurturing the child's language and speech development. So, you know, having to talk louder, having to one parent beautifully talked about having um, making sure that the child used their voice and asked for things and just didn't just use gesture and pointing. Um, another talked about having to make sure that all the daycare staff understood that their child needed to have um, their attention, you know, needed to be tapped on the shoulder, need to be talked to directly, need to be talked to at their level. So I thought it was, um, yeah, so they were working really hard to, really hard to support their um, kids in a number of ways. Um, and not just their kids, as we've said before, but the, the kids in the community. Yeah, I remember we took, there were so many examples where they were looking out for, for other families and other, other kids and saying, oh, your kid might have something similar. Um, yeah. Tumaine or Tony, um, do you have any reflections on that or things that you either found striking in these interviews or the kinds of things that you've seen caregivers being so proactive with um, that's really struck you? Oh, I think it's, you know, pretty much the same. I mean, it's, it's 
it's interesting before doing e-health research and looking into these sort of things that you know you kind of you kind of feel like your gp and your nurses and all that should know what to do <clears throat> so it's really striking to find that yeah the amount of times parents had to be proactive parents had to push the envelope to get a referral to an ent or a, or a speechy or whoever it might be yeah so that that to me was like oh wow i didn't realize you know how i guess broken this sort of pathway is especially for our young kids you know like and then not only that like to have our parents and our carers at home trying to you know get their own strategies in place on how to communicate with their kids or you know i think it's it's just really a reflection on what megan said but that, that really really comes to you when you when you're reading this data you know and it's yeah i just thought there'd be a better pathway i thought there'd be a better better understanding from the health professionals and and gps into that um so i guess that's my my little bit on that Tony, how's your sound going? Did you have any other thoughts or want to try to see how your sound's going? I'm not sure if you can hear me, and I, I, and I do apologise. Um, but look, I, I, I'm just supporting everything that both Tremaine and Mia have said. So yeah, that that kind of leads nicely on to a bit of a discussion about the other theme about the complexity of pathways. Um, Megan, can you give us a brief overview of some of the um, complexity of ear health and hearing pathways that caregivers discussed in the interviews? Yeah, I, I keep I keep thinking about this, and part of it is just that ear disease is a complex um, condition. Okay, because it's 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 not just the the condition that we're faced with or that the, the GP might be faced with when the family turns up. It's the long term ramifications and and how it's impacting on the child and will keep impacting on the child. So it is a complex condition. Um, and, you know, what's what's the most important thing um, for a parent? Um, so but it's it's. I think it's made more complex than it has to be because of how maybe health services work in, you know, who do you go to for your hearing test and then who do you go to for the GP and then how do you get to the ENT and um, families might see an ENT at an AMS, but if they want grommet surgery, then they have to deal with the state health system and the hospital system, which is a, a different system. So it's a different waiting list. Um, I'm, I'm going to quote, use a quote again, and this is once again from a New South Wales parent. Um, I booked in to see a private ENT at that point just to get another review because I think it was like another huge wait to see the ENT specialist who comes back to the art show. I can't remember how long the wait was, but it was just too long. I just wanted to get on top of it before he started school and all that jazz. So it's it's another level of anxiety that parents have and that it's ongoing um yeah I, I mean i think we and just how fragment i was struck by how fragmented the services are and maybe how fragmented the advice that parents get or it's oh yes you have an ear infection go to your gp and then it's well okay but how do i help my child today yeah, thanks for that, Megan. So yeah, that really came out in a lot of those caregiver interviews that the multiple and fragmented services, the long wait times, which we know about, and that kind of lack of clear messaging too around ear health and hearing. Um, did you have any more thoughts on some of those issues around complex pathways, Tremaine? I guess one of the main complex about the pathway is the wait time, you know, like um you know why your kid come comes in with an ear infection or or some any any reason why you decide to go to your gp first sometimes they can sort of fix it and it, you know it might put a band-aid on it for a month or you know a couple of weeks or something like that and then come back and it's it's a reinfection of the ear again or you know and then they do the same thing i mean i had that with my my own daughter you know like she had constant ear infections and you know, i wasn't really getting anywhere so um i guess being in this space i knew well i know i know i need to get an ent referral i know i need to get these processes in place but it's just about you know they don't really 
there isn't a clear pathway for it. Like it'd, it'd be nice if you have one ear infection and you get a referral to an ENT or something like that. I know, I know it'd probably bulk up the wait list, but it's important that our kids get looked at early. You know, you know, I think when we've done one of the studies, it was like they're not getting their um, hearing aids or something until like they were seven. Like that's a big, big long time. And by that stage, you know, they're probably in year two, so they've missed out on all this early education, which we know is so important for you know, our young people and, and their development that you know, if they're not hearing properly, they're so far behind already. It's just that, that's that's a really, you know, a downfall on, on what's going on at the moment. But, yeah, complexity is definitely wait times as well. Um, yeah, heard there's years from from pe people and patients that I talked to that have been on the wait list for years before they can even see an ENT or, or get the surgery or, you know, there's just... And then, like Megan was saying, there's different levels to it as well. Like, you know, you can go to a GP, get an get a antibiotic and fix that ear infection. And if that clears up, great. But then what's the wait time to go in to get a hearing test? And to see your ENT and to get surgery and, you know, all those sort of things. Is, it just makes it really complex. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That definitely came out. I think there was one parent who talked about their child being on the wait list since he was born and he's now four. So for that was for ENT surgery. Yeah. Um, can you explain a little bit to um, either Tony if your sound is working or Tremaine if, if Tony's sound isn't working so well, um, just how it can, even for urban families in New South Wales, it can be really difficult to access and navigate pathways as well? Oh, I, I guess working, you know, in the Newcastle area at the moment, like, I always just go back to pathways, but it's, it's you know, the a whole lot of it really like it's so so hard for our families to know what to do and if if they haven't had their kids go through it before or you know have an auntie or an uncle that have, have put their nephews and nieces through it or whatever that family member might be to you then there's just unknown for you you know so unless you've got like I said someone in that health space or you know a family member or a friend that's had problems with ears or their hearing before that you can sort of call upon and go, hey, what do I do? What do I do next? Because yeah, I am just going to a GP and this is what's going on. This is the referral or this is the wait time. You know, what are things that we can do? So even though places like Newcastle, you think they've got a lot of <laughs> a lot of services here, it's still just the same, you know? Like I just, mm, I don't know. I don't know what to say about it, but it's just a bit frustrating at times, especially when you know it is so important for our young followers and young, young mob, you know. Yeah, definitely. And you worked both at Aboriginal Medical Services and Mainstream Services. Do you think the pathways have been easier for families in one or the other, or it can depend a lot on local services and pathways? <clears throat> I think, look, in, in the, uh, like the AMSs that I've worked at, it's really good because we have visiting ENT specialists that come there. Um, but in saying that, there's, you know, they might be there once every month or once every two months or three months. It depends on, you know, the funding they've got for for the ENT specialist to come out and and obviously the ENT's um, schedule and stuff like that. So for for a part of it, I believe the AMSs have got it a bit better because they got that direct link to a, to an ENT. They sh they know that pathway a lot better. But in the other sense is, yeah, if they're only there once every month, once every two or three months, you know, and they're only there for a day, they might see 20 kids, but there might be 100 waiting, you know, like, so in that sense, it's a bit the other way as well. And then working in a mainstream practice, it's, I'm just finding it that, I guess, lack of knowledge of the pathway and what they should be doing is, is you know, as hard. So I, both, I guess they're both got pros and cons to it. Um, yeah, but. I, if I could, I'd love it. Uh, it's easier with the AMS, but then it depends on the ENT schedule and their funding and stuff like that. They can get to see a specialist earlier than than waiting a longer time on a public wait system or something like that. Yeah, fantastic. And that, yeah, definitely came out in some of those interviews too. I think, yeah, Kegi was saying that the AMS had really helped them navigate that, but sometimes those wait times or if they'd missed it, you know, especially during COVID, that was extra challenges as well, they said. Um, Megan, so I think when we originally started the study, we'd, we were asking kind of specifically about audiology and speech pathology services, but given that 
you know, we were using these yarns, parents really chose what they wanted to talk about and they really wanted to talk about this whole pathway rather than just audiology and speech pathology. Um, can you explain, I guess as an audiologist yourself, a bit about how it's really helpful as a clinician to understand caregivers' perspectives on the whole pathway? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, as an audiologist, you know, my focus is hearing. But um, it's, I was reminded by these parents how important it is that, you know, parents might come in and their, their focus might be on how the child's speaking or the child's balance or um, how that they're snoring at night or their behaviour. So, you know, to find out what their concern is and really listen and it sounds really simple and straightforward, but I think it's a really good reminder to us all that we have to do it. And, you know, in a busy clinic, when you're aware that there's people in the waiting room, you're kind of trying to get through as many people as as you want, as you need to. But um, so spending, taking that time to really listen to the pair and work out and put you know, that they're really stressed out about it. They might have waited a long time for this appointment. They don't know what to expect. Um, and and just to go, oh, you know, the hearing's okay today or, oh, yeah, I'll see you in three months and we'll keep an eye on it. It's like it's it's not enough. Yeah, we need to be more proactive in in communicating with the other people in the pathway and, and helping parents navigate. Yeah, there was that fantastic quote from one parent, um, you know, talking about, you know, that sometimes it feels like there's no respect for what it means for your kid. And she kind of reflected that perhaps it's part, it's because it's part of, it's just one part of the hearing journey. Mm -hmm. She says, it's like all this emotional build up that's already happening. And she said, you're like, oh, bugger, this is just like another kind of thing that's happening. And then you have to see another specialist and they have to ask more questions. And then she goes on to say, I guess every part happens in a siloed section. There isn't that kind of continual understanding and respect of what the patient or family is actually going through. Um, and I thought that was, yeah, such a kind of um, strong quote um, about how, you yeah. know, these these little parts of the pathway and, and sometimes, you know, the families are having to deal with this whole thing, but clinicians might be only seeing them at one point. So it's, yeah, I remember we've had some discussions about how helpful that is then to keep that in mind. Um, that, that's, that families that's right. And then, of too. course, there might be other health issues and other kids and, you know, a whole lot of other stuff happening. Um, so caregivers, I think, again, part of their proactivity, but also um, just suggestions around both what would help them and what would help them with the whole pathways, they had a range of recommendations that they provided throughout these interviews. Um, some are kind of more easily implementable as well as others that are kind of around large systemic changes. Um, I think that there might be a, another, is there an echo or is there something on? Um, but one of these things was around um, caregivers really wanted family-centred and culturally safe care. Uh, they wanted explanations from services, both when booking and during appointments. Um, they wanted some more information, including leaflets, maybe an app, uh, community meetings, um, to provide more information about OM, about hearing loss and about those local pathways. Um, they wanted support and intervention before children start school, like that, kit, that quote that Megan uh, read before, uh, and health systems and services that were less siloed and partnering with other sectors, so including partnering with education, partnering with disability services or other community services. Um, and something that, that I found particularly striking, um, because we've been working on another project to do with ear checks, um, the, a number of caregivers said they really wanted regular ear health and hearing checks in primary care. Um, so we might reflect on a few of those, but uh, Tremaine, could you have a talk about um, what family-centred and culturally safe care uh, might look like or what does the sort of best practice? I guess with that, you know, like um, just just to be feeling like you're, you're an actual person, um, to be acknowledged that you know, I know I'm, for, I'm an Aboriginal man, and and that I'm just going to get the same respect from no matter who I go to. You know, um, it can be 
you know, things like having Aboriginal paintings around. It can be Aboriginal staff. It can be something in your your clinic or your practice that that shows that you know you acknowledge and that you accept Aboriginal people for who they are, and you just treat them the same as you would anybody else. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a lot of I always tell it to the GPs that are coming through and training. You know, the young young guys just treat them like they're a normal person. You know, you don't have to treat them any differently. Um, always explain things that, that you're talking about. Don't just use, you know, medical jargon and stuff like that. Always in my in my own practice, um, you know, always explain what what this means. And, you know, it can be just as simple as simple as, you know, your blood pressure is, you know, 120 on 80 and this is why this is good or this is why this is bad, you know, and this is what we're going to do to fix it or, you know, just the explanation to it as well and not just the, the acknowledging that, you know, they they don't know everything. That they need a they need just a simple simple answer, really. Um, but yeah, I think and being I guess family centered is acknowledging that you know Aboriginal culture. It's it's not just the one person. You know, like we are a community. You know, like we do we rely on our family, our you know extended family, grandparents, carers, aunties, uncles, even just community people. So to be aware of you know family dynamics and um connection to community and, and country and stuff like that. that that's that's what i see as you know being family centered and culturally safe for for any person that comes into your practice or your you know clinic or whatever you've got there it's really yeah fantastic yeah that picked up a lot of things that that caregivers had really spoken about as well and and wanting that respect and um feeling somewhere that was yeah comfortable and then reflected on the differences um of going to a local ams where there were things that made them feel really welcome whereas other things were a bit yeah clinics seemed to be kind of sterile um yeah fantastic um the other that had been a question from an audience member uh, beforehand as well about what some of the barriers uh, might be uh, for Aboriginal people receiving good audiological services, or I guess, I mean, that could be extended to, to good uh, care in, in this ear health and hearing space. Do you have any reflections on that? Or Tony, feel free to jump in if, if you think your audio is going to work again. Okay. <laughs> or you can feel free to pop things in the chat as well, Tony. It's such a pity the audio wasn't great because you've got oh, such no. great things to say. Oh, that's oh, better. No. Sounds much yeah, better. I'm back. I, I, I moved around till I found a really quiet space. Um, yeah, because my earphones just didn't want to work. I, look, I think um, just perhaps a couple of barriers to think about would if if um, people are in rural and remote areas, and I say that here in Newcastle, though we're sort of centred in the middle of a regional space, there are areas around here that um, can be a little bit difficult for people to get transport in. So um, you've got to think about how people might be able to access some of these services. So transport can be a really big issue. Um, and then you've got to think about, you know, families taking time off work to actually get there if they're from... Um, you know, one family source of incomes and there might be only one driver in the in the family. So that all sort of um, needs to be considered and that type of stuff. Um, yeah, that's probably one of the biggest things when I talk to a lot of different families. And if I think about particular my community, like the community that I'm from, from Karua, there's one bus in and out. Uh, GPs, there's a couple of GPs there, there's a couple of uh, other visiting services, but people have still got to travel, you know, 20 minutes in a car to the local uh, where they can access some audiology services or other services. Um, but if they don't have a car, how are they going to get there? As I said, there's a bus that leaves at time in the morning and then we'll come back in the afternoon so I think sometimes um, that really needs to be taken in consideration. Yeah thanks and that really does pick up what a number of caregivers talked about in the interviews too that yeah needing to travel um, both New South Wales caregivers and also NT caregivers having to travel often quite long distances definitely. Yeah well, the other thing um, is about you know Parents are having to tell their story, their story three or four different times. That becomes a really tiring for parents 
if they have to constantly tell people the same thing 20 times. In the end, the parents go, you know what, what what's the, um, they'll keep going, but, yeah, I, I think it's really important that when parents are telling you something, you, you open your ears and listen because they're not saying it for the sake of it. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And we'd almost finish up on that because I know we have to get some to some question times, but I just wanted to ask uh, ask you, Tremaine, about why you think, um, so, well, first of all, I'll just say um, a quick kind of promo for next year. Um, a group of researchers, um, both from NAL and a working group and an expert panel and other researchers we've been collaborating with, um, we've been working on another study developing evidence-based and consensus recommendations about the components and timing of year checks. Um, of year health and hearing checks in primary health care and that, that there's going to be a sound bites, a whole sound bites on that next year. Um, we can ask Sam more about that or the, the sound bites team. Um, but I think Tremaine, you were on uh, the working group for that. Can you um, just kind of very briefly before we open to questions, just say how you think ear health and hearing checks in primary health care um, could be really important for caregivers and how it would help them um, in the ways they're having to be proactive or, or helping them navigate pathways? I guess, I guess when we're looking at that, you know, like, I guess one of the things I always think about is if we have regular checks and regular screenings and stuff like that, that we might be able to pick these things up earlier. So the whole, um, I guess, getting a a uh, whole, I guess, checklist on on doing hearing checks and when it should be done, stuff like that. It's going to be really, really important. Um, hopefully, you know, like we can do this. I don't even know the timing on it, but if we do it every, you know, three months or something like that, we're going to be on top of it. You know, it's not going to be this big, um, you know, questions that, you know, you got these parents coming in and going, well, you know, ear infection or not listening well, that and it just gets put off and put off. If we have these consistent checks and and hearing screening and tests and stuff like that, we've just got this this just bunch of information on that one child on hey, at you know three months they were at, at this level and at six months they're at this level and nine months they're at this level. Like if they've decreased or or improved, like what what happened in those those three months or yeah, you know, it mightn't be three months, it might be a month or six months, whatever it is. But you know what what's happened in there? What What's the change that you guys have done? Um, you know, oh, there's been no ear, ear infection in the last six months and the hearing's really picked up. Or, you know, oh, we've had surgery and, you know, the grommets are working and all this stuff. So I guess, yeah, it's, it's important to have a more consistent hearing check that everyone can go off, that we don't have this big, I guess, question about a pathway or, you know, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And I think, yeah, a number of caregivers had said, I think that would have really helped them not having to be so proactive because there would be these regular checks in place, I think, and that, that would have helped them kind of pick it up early rather than having to keep pushing themselves to get it done. Fantastic. I'm aware of the time. So I just want to, to finish up, I just wanted to finish with another quote um, from a New South Wales caregiver because um, there were just so many fantastic quotes. We could have just sat here and read quotes. They're amazing. Um, but this one is, yeah, quite striking. Um, she said, if I was a doctor or a boss or something, I'd probably go to a head meeting and say, you know, this needs to change and this needs to happen and this isn't good enough. But I'm not a doctor and people aren't going to listen to me because I'm just one mum. So we really assured her that we were listening um, and that we would be continuing to listen and working for change. And so we really thank all of you for listening today as well. And we look forward to uh, ongoing discussions. Um, so we'd be really happy to take some questions. I've been sort of seeing in the background some things coming through in the chat. Um, and you're very welcome to email us or the Soundbites team to stay in touch so we can um, be in contact. Um, we're currently working on a paper to write up these results so we can uh, let you know and that's that's out as well thank you so much and i think xiao yin you will pull out some questions for us is that right
Yes, hello. Thank you so much for those insights. Um, so yes, the, the questions are popping up now. Um, before we go through them, I just want to let everyone know that keep the uh, questions and comments coming because we can keep them at the end of the chat um, and all our panelists can see them so we can address them um, to you individually, even if we don't get to them today. Um, and thank you so much for pushing through some technical issues that we might be having um, as well, but we didn't let any of that stop us. So well done, everyone. OK, so um, we, we have a question from Amanda Leach. Um, what do parents say about prevention strategies, um, early detection and, and treatment uh, in brackets antibiotics um, in primary health care? That's a great um, question. <laughs> Do you want to jump in, Megan? It's a, tr it's a tricky question. No, that, that could be a whole sound bite. Um, yeah, there were mention of well, the frustration of repeated antibiotics and um, uh, several of the parents talked about the long-term, um, their anxiety about the long-term um, you know, problems with a child being on, on antibiotics. Um, other parents talked about introducing um, nose blowing regimes and, and getting those reinforced by the um, childcare hand washing. Other parents, particularly ones in the Northern Territory, talked about um, being really careful where their kids swam. Um, so it, it it was, yeah, I mean, we. I'd like to go into that more um, with parents and carers. It would be really interesting. Um, but when it was touched on, it was quite interesting that the the scope of what what they came up with. So that is that does that address your question, Amanda? And I guess and I guess to Amanda just to say that that I guess that wasn't a main focus around prevention mm. strategies because we were talking particularly to parents who already have had to travel a fair way along the pathway. Um, so yeah, that it definitely came up a little bit. Some of the seek, you know, the things parents tried to do to to seek prevention or to seek things becoming more of a problem. Um, but certainly, yeah, we hadn't asked a lot of detailed questions about that. So hopefully, that's that covers it enough from just from what we have. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and another question from Sarah Murphy um, from Western Australia. She says hi to the team. Um, she's asking, are you looking at linking hearing screening or ear checks into the MBS 750, uh, 750 to encourage their completion in primary care settings, uh, both um, Aboriginal community controlled health organisations? Um, and mainstream. We may have to wait for the sound bites for ear check, but <laughs> no. Um, but no, I think there, there's been lots of discussion about how to link it with lots of different checks. And I think that was something that caregivers even spoke about as well. How can we link this to this check or link it to vaccinations or link it to when a child is in for something else? Um, Tremaine or Tony, do you have any other thoughts on that? I was just going to say Tremaine may have a wealth of knowledge around this, considering that um, during uh, one of our race, um, conducting our research is something that Tremaine did. So Tremaine, oh, I'm going to leave that. I think that's a great question for you to answer. I, I guess um, li linking um, ear health checks into the 715 uh, is something that I already do. Um, so it, it it is bigger than just the the practitioner doing it. Um, I know the um, I think it's the NACHO guidelines for seven one fives. I'm pretty sure they're including the hearing into it now. But in saying that, it, it is very open, if that's the right word. It's just not as detailed as what it, as what it should be. Um, so I know when I do a seven one five hearing check, you know, like. Um, you've got the OM6 questionnaire you can do for, for older kids. You've got plum and hats checklists that we can do for younger kids. Um, there's a lot more than <clears throat> just asking how how the hearing is going um, because I know before I even done any sort of ear health research that my, yeah, my, my knowledge on hearing was, uh, hey, how do you think your hearing is going? 
you know, and then you get parents saying, oh, yeah, they, they don't listen sometimes. You know, I just selective here and you'll shrug it off and we'll, we'll say that, and, you know, like they just don't really focus on it. But with certain and specific questions, um, you know, we get a bit more detail in, um, especially like the plum and hatch. So under sevens, we do that for, um, you know, it asks like when it's quiet, what does the kid do? And when it's loud, does the kid answer you more? And, um, you know, can they hear sounds outside? Um, when they when you're talking to them in a different room, do they can they hear you and understand you? And, and these sort of things. Like I found that really, really effective in my hearing screening for a 715, for especially for our young kids. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely, I'd love to see it linked into it um, fully, you know, into an actual template um, and and all these new checklists that I guess we're going to try and recommend in the future when we should do the hearing screening, hearing checklists and stuff like that. So I hope that answers your question, Sarah. Fantastic. Thanks, Jermaine. Thank you. And we do have um, a few more questions come through where people are thinking of ways to to change this <laughs> to support the pathway. Um, so one from Paul Hickey um, thinking, uh, could additional training and clear guidelines for scopes of practice assist to cut through pathways and ensure um, in the in the right place, uh, ensure actions in the right place at the right time um, assist some families um, and also he listed out some ways that an audiologist could be um, able to better facilitate and be a facilitator of that pathway to make it easier. Wow that's a huge question. Tremaine do you want to take the first bit and then Megan to take the audiology bit? Um, so I think it was around training for, for um, pathways. Yeah, I guess, you know, it, it, it would be beneficial if there were training around um, specific pathways for hearing health. Um, you know, I, I even in my training there, there's not much about it. Um, you know, we get to look, yeah, know how to look into a, you know, otoscope and look in the eardrum and see if it's healthy or not healthy. But um, for what next and then what pathways happen is not really known. Um, I know with the GPs that come through in training, um, for, for instance, I've got one young fella at the moment that's, you know, in his last term of his, of his GP practice. Um, we're doing an ear health clinic now together, but he said he's only done one one day of ENT training. So you look at that for a GP who's done who's done five years in university and this will probably be his third year out and he's only done one day, you know, so we can sort of see the barrier right there. Um, so absolutely, additional training, clear guidelines, you know, would be immensely helpful. Um, and even then, like, even the referrals to an ENT, like, why, why does that got to go through a GP? You know, why can't you either audiologist write that referral or, or a nurse or, a, you know, an AHP or somebody else write that referral? Because that's, that's another thing in, you know, like, and you, you know, your kid gets sick, and then it's a week or two weeks or three weeks before you get to see a GP. And by the time you see a GP, it's cleared up, you know. And they're like, "Oh well, we can't do nothing. I'm gonna try and catch it next time." And then you wait for another, <clears throat> excuse me. And then you wait more time, and you know, same sort of process goes into place as well. So, I hand it to Megan. Jermaine, I've been. I think. I think all audiologists. Have been wanting to be able to refer straight to ENTs for years. So, yeah, it is very frustrating. Um, I guess the second part of your question, Paul, is that the the pathways vary so much, um, not just from state to state, but everywhere across, from region to region across the country. So, I guess developing no, local knowledge of where families can go and local, um, I guess local, I, I'm trying to think of a really good word, but but local contacts, so, you know, people who, who can help navigate. So if you're a visiting audiologist, it's, it's if you can make ties with um, people who are in a position to help families navigate and know what's around um you know i'm very aware that 
me saying, oh, you know, I'm going to recommend that you get a speech pathology assessment, but if speech pathology waitlist is six months in that community, then it's, it's you're just adding another stress to that family. So knowing those things is, is really important. Thank you so much for those um, those answers as well. Um, and maybe just the last one, if we can squeeze it in. Uh, Eugenie is wondering, could a um, AHP, Australian Health pr Practitioner, professional, uh, be assigned to case manage a child or a family through this pathway? And this is to address the how we, we have to explain things a million times to, <laughs> to all these different people. What are thoughts on that? I was going to have all to remain on that one again. <laughs> I assume they're talking about Aboriginal health practitioner there, I think, to case manage, yeah. And I think in some places there are kind of ear health coordinators and things. I don't know if, yeah, you or Tony yeah. could speak about that. Yeah, I guess, you know, like um, there could be an ear health coordinator um, that we go through and, you know, that would be good for each practice maybe to have. Um, practicality of it, I'm, I'm not sure it's really possible right now but definitely some practices could definitely put an AHP on um, and assign just to EL and hearing and you know create that that link between um, GP to Hearing Australia or an audiologist and the ENT specialist and stuff like that um, I think it would alleviate definitely telling your story a hundred times by having someone that sort of case manages it um, yeah but I guess I guess I just think about the wait list here in Newcastle and stuff like that, how many people that would be um, and, you know, how, how many per person that would be for the AHP is, is, a, is a large number. Um, but in an ideal world, yeah, absolutely. It, it would be awesome to have that to help out and have that pathway there. Mm. So unfortunately, it is time for us to um, to wrap up. So um, very big thank you to all our panelists today for um, such an insightful discussion, um, and and also just like the the caregivers being proactive and persistent, and families being persistent, um, we are also um, observing. Um, the team here being very persistent on the on the research and our actions and our findings, trying to um, understand and change um, for the better. Um, so on behalf of now Soundbites production team, uh, thank you for joining our webinar. Um, thank you for all the panelists and attendees and the production team and see you all next year. Mm -hmm.